to be solved. Uh, we need to turn off annotations. Yeah, I have already disabled it. Already done it? Very yes. good. Thank you. So let us begin very quickly. Shrivat Sabam Shakalasho, the Dikos to Bessia, Shriva, Saragava Guru, Stanayam, Tatasha, Vidya, Vapya, Vibudhota, Matam, the Dhanam, Kurbe, Sadahar, the Guru, Karuna, Karakim, Lakshmi, Natha, Samar, and Bam, Nathayam, Munamadhyam, Asmadajari, Pariantam, Mande, Guru Paramparam, Yonit, Yamachuta Padam, Buja, Yudma, Rukma, Pyamo, Hatasta, Ditarani, Truna, Yamene, Asmad Guru, Bhagavatosia, the Yaikas in Do. Rama Nujasya Charano Sharanam Prapadye Sriman Venkatanatharya Kavitar Kikakesari Vedan Tacharya Varyome Sannidhattam Sadahrudi. Today's agenda is about Advars. Last time we saw about some ancient people who had talked about Vishishtadvaita. Like we saw Bodhayana Maharshi, we saw Kashyapa Maharshi, we saw Yajnavalkya. This time, we are going to see people who are not directly mentioned in those scriptures, but who were great saints who followed Vishishtadvaita. In Tamil, we call them Alvar. So we will look at the meaning of the word Alvar. Today's agenda would not cover their uh, lifetimes, but would focus on what Alvar means and the concept of Nitya Suri in Vishishtadvaita. Why are we covering a concept now? For two reasons. Firstly, this is a Vishishtadvaita class, so we should not uh, focus too much on people and ignore the philosophical aspect. Secondly, the Alvars are considered to be Nitya Suris. So that concept has to be understood. That is what today's class is going to be about. Alvar means one who is immersed. You could be immersed in a lot of things, but in our specific context, these saints are called as Alvars because they are immersed in Bhakti. They have complete devotion and they are devoted at all points of time and whenever they show devotion, they show it to the supreme extent. That bhakti could be shown anywhere. There are people who have bhakti towards work, but maybe their work is not appropriate. There are people who have bhakti towards uh, their parents, which is really great, uh, but the parents are not going to be eternally available. There are people who have bhakti towards uh, random uh, strangers also, if they are very rich or very powerful. But that is a wrong kind of bhakti. So the word bhakti, if we look at it, Bhagavad Ramanuja explains when giving the commentary under the first shloka of the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, he explains the meaning of the word bhakti itself. He says, Sneha Purva Manudhyanam Bhaktirit Yabhidhiyate. This is a statement that defines the word bhakti given in Linga Purana. So Bhagavad Ramanuja cites Linga Purana to explain what bhakti means. Bhakti is Sneha Purva Manudhyanam. It is not just contemplation, but it is contemplation which is Sneha Purva, that is full of love. So that contemplation out of love that is shown towards whom? Towards Bhagavan. So they show that love towards Bhagavan in their thoughts, words and actions. So in their thoughts, they think about performing seva to Bhagavan out of bhakti. In their words, they praise him. Therefore, it counts as seva. In their actions, they behave as prescribed by scriptures and therefore it is again seva. Now, if we go through uh, some modern websites and papers, they would say that 
the word alvar is a later one originally these people were addressed as alvar alvar means one who rules a ruler so uh, is which one is correct should we really say alvar or should we say alvar we might identify these saints as alvars because they could be called as the foremost of devotees and therefore the ruler among devotee is called an alvar but if we look at the lives of these saints they always identified themselves only as alvars they had more pleasure in being identified as people with bhakti towards bhagavan sevaka swabhava towards bhagavan as a servant who performs service that is something that would give them a greater pleasure than being called as a king a ruler the foremost among people and so on so they themselves considered themselves to be sevakas that is people who do seva people sometimes they say that servant is inferior being a person who performs seva is inferior but if we really think about it when we perform seva to our parents or when between husband and wife there is seva we don't really consider it to be a very bad thing in fact it is a great thing and it should be done out of love right the purest form of seva should be done out of love not the kind of uh, slavery that was practiced here on earth but a kind of servitude that comes out of devotion which is full of love and affection for bhagavan that is how the alvars considered themselves technically speaking these alvars are to be called as nityas what does nitya mean we are going to see so today's lecture is predominantly going to be about this part only vishishta dvaita we saw in the last class classifies entities into three you have chit achit and ishvara what are these three there is if you look at advaita vedanta there is atma and anatma in paramartha only atma is there in vyavahara atma and anatma are both perceived this is how the explanation is given in vishishta advaita there is a slightly different way of classification atma is considered to be of two types one is ishvara who is also called paramatma the supreme atma called paramatma the supreme consciousness as modern people call it then there is a non supreme level of consciousness that is also an entity so it is not parama chetana but it is a chetana it is a living being what constitutes a living being a living being should compulsorily have an atma that atma is addressed as chit or as jeevatma so atma is of two types in vishishta advaita it is jeevatma and paramatma jeevatma is called as chit and paramatma is called as ishvara okay chit means sentient being ishvara means controller the supreme being the supreme sentient being you can control only if you are sentient so the supreme sentient being ishvara who is completely realized completely knowledgeable completely able and a partially able partially knowledgeable yet sentient being chit 
these two constitute atma okay then what is not atma that comes under achit achit literally means that which is not chit chit means sentient so achit means non sentient like a table wall the entire earth all of those that we have here would come under achit atma itself the jiva would be called as chit and the supreme being paramatma would be called as ishvara this is the classification now inside this there are further sub classifications but before that we need to understand the relationship between ishvara chit and achit ishvara as i said is paramatma and if you remember from the previous class we said that it is that paramatma who is there along with the entire universe who is considered to be a single entity so while we say that there is only one paramatma he is chidachit vishishta brahma chidachit vishishta meaning he is there along with chit and achit this needs to be understood further what do you mean by he is there along with chit and achit do we not say that uh, bhagavan created the world how do we understand creation such questions might arise so we will have to look at that as well what is the exact relationship between ishvara chit and achit the relationship is quite simple time is eternal since eternity there has been one atma who has been supreme in all ways when we say supreme it means that this atma is void of any bad quality and would be possessing only auspicious qualities but as it is supreme each of these auspicious qualities would be present in the supreme magnitude supreme realization supreme knowledge supreme ability and so on that supreme state is called ishvaratva that supreme being is called ishvara or paramatma if you look at the veda or even bhagavad gita there are statements that say that atma is beginningless na jayate mriyate eva mriyate dies jayate takes birth na jayate mriyate eva does not take birth or experience death that is stated about the nature of the atma so ishvara does not have a beginning and does not have an end okay very fine but what about chit that is jeevatma chit is also an atma and therefore as it is also atma it is also beginningless it is also beginningless so jeeva is beginningless as per vishishta advaita a beginningless jeeva and a beginningless paramatma how are the two related then you are saying then that paramatma could not have created the jeeva yes that is true but here and there within the scriptures we see statements that appear to say that he only created the world he only created all living beings and so on how do we understand this this word creation 
will not be applicable if the two entities in consideration, one should be the cause, one should be the effect. But you are saying that both entities are eternal. That is not possible. Logically, so if one comes after the other, you can say that it is created. If both are coming from the beginning, where is creation happening? So the word creation has to be understood. This creation is explained with the help of Achit. Achit, that is Anatma, Jada, that which is non-living, non-sentient. It is classified into three types. There is Prakriti, Kala, referring to time, of course. Time is by itself not living. It is a dimension. Prakriti, referring to the nature that we have. And then, finally, a state called Shuddha Sattva. This state of Shuddha Sattva, you would see it in the Vishishtadvaita Vedanta of Bhagavad Ramanuja. You would see it in Dvaita Vedanta of uh, Madhvacharya. You would see it in Achintya Bheda Bheda of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. You would see it in Shuddhadvaita of Balabhacharya and so on. Every Vaishnava Sampradaya that adheres to the Vedic scriptures would believe in the concept of Shuddha Sattva. That has to be understood then. Now we have more terms. We said to understand the relationship between Ishvara and Chit, we have to understand something in between. That is Achit. Then we said Achit itself is of three types. Non-living things are of three types. Which three types? Prakriti, that is the nature that we have. Kala, that is time and Shuddha Sattva. Kala is easy to understand. We have said it is time. What about Prakriti and Shuddha Sattva? Prakriti has another name. It is called Mishra Sattva. Prakriti is comprised of three types of entities. In fact, these are called three gunas. One is Sattva Guna, one is Rajoguna, one is Tamoguna. Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. Prakriti, anything and everything that is seen in Prakriti, anything and everything that I see on earth is made up of Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. I am not saying that a table would be made up of sattva, a chair would be made up of rajas or like that. I am saying the table would itself have all the three gunas, the chair would also have all the three gunas. In this manner, every entity is going to have three gunas. As a matter of fact, even the atma can be in svabhava, although not in svarupa, in original nature of being, it would not have these gunas. But in terms of behavior, you would see sattvika guna, rajasika guna and tamasika guna. So sattva, rajas and tamas are what constitute prakriti. And prakriti, as I said, everything in prakriti has all of these. So everything is a mixture. Hence the word Mishra. Mishra Sattva means Sattva that is mixed with non-Sattva. What is non-Sattva? Rajas and Tamas. So Sattva, Rajas, Tamas, these three put together constitute Prakriti. And these cannot be separated from each other. Because every entity in Prakriti has all the three. Is it ever possible to have just one of those gunas? Yes, it is possible. Which guna? Sattva guna. 
where there is only sattva guna, we call it as shuddha sattva. Shuddha means pure. So shuddha, shuddha sattva means pure sattva. Pure sattva guna. No rajas, no tamas. No anger. No real sadness. No anger. No laziness. Nothing evil. That kind of a state. Where do you see it? Of course, you see it in the very pure nature of Chit. And you also see it in Ishvara. So let us say that Ishvara is taking avatars. He is coming as Rama. He is coming as Krishna. The body of Rama would be of Shuddha Sattva nature. The body of Krishna would be of Shuddha Sattva nature. But then how do you distinguish between the two, uh, between Prakrita Sharira and Shuddha Sattva Sharira? Rama looked just like a human. We did not see much of a difference in him. Of course, he was tall, his arms were uh, longer. Uh, there are certain descriptions that are told about him. But those still fit into uh, the nature of a human being. So how is it very different? The difference is that something that is Prakrita would be bound to deteriorate over a period of time. Anything that is made up of Prakriti would deteriorate over a period of time. Take my own body, for example. If I don't take bath every day, it will automatically start stinking. The body becomes dirty by nature. Take the example of a stone. Over a period of time, some dust comes and gets collected in it. Take the example of river water. When the river starts, the water is very pure. But as it travels, it collects more and more impurities. So, impurities are always there in Prakriti. These impurities are constituted predominantly by Rajoguna and Tamoguna. These impurities are absent in Shuddha Sattva. So, Shuddha Sattva is a state or rather it is a type of non-living entity that is 100% pure. Is this understood? If it is understood, Achit is very... Achit could be either time, because time is not a living entity. It is a dimension. Or it could be pure material or impure material. Pure material is called Shuddha Sattva. It is eternally pure. It cannot get polluted in any way. Mishra Sattva is called Prakriti. That is what we identify as the nature. When we look around this world, this physical world, physical universe, all of that would come under Prakriti. So, these are the three types of Achit. Before I proceed further, I would like to confirm whether uh, this much is clear to everybody. If you have any doubt, please feel free to ask. Uh, if there is no doubt, I will take it as uh, you having understood so that I can move on and explain further. I have given a two. No, it is clear. Uh, I am Janakira. Uh, Yes, sir. Only doubt is, uh, I mean, in some of the teachings, what we have understood is Jivatma has to become Suddha Sattva. But here it is shown in Achit. Uh, see, uh, Shuddha Sattva is what? It is a type of Guna. Okay. A material that is made up of Shuddha Sattva is also called Shuddha Sattva. When in Vishishta Dvaita we say that Jivatma has to become Shuddha Sattva, 
it implies that the jivatma has to do dharana of a shuddha sattva rupa when the mind itself contains all the three gunas not just the body even the mind contains all the three gunas at all points of time if i am thinking in the perfect manner if i am experiencing the perfect bliss and so on maybe you could say there is shuddha sattva but we don't see it in people so the jiva due to its association with the body which is made up of achit which is made up of prakrita sharira prakrita right it is made up of prakriti so this prakriti is what the chit is associated with when we are here when we are here that you will understand further when i explain the classification of chit which we are going to go to as soon as this part is complete thank you sir thank you so, it's clearer thanks so when baddha becomes mukta the prakriti part whatever is mishra sattva or prakriti in the chit will become shuddha sattva okay that is uh, how it is going to happen so anyway atma by itself is very pure very as in supremely pure even the jiva is supremely pure the only difference is uh, of course that it does not possess that quality of paramatma which makes it parama paramatma has certain supreme qualities apart from supreme purity purity is called amalatva amala means pure but Uh, there are some other co- uh, qualities as well that bhagwan eternally has that the jiva does not have so these restrictions some restrictions will go away when it attains mukti so when chit attains mukti it will be called mukta at that point of time all the gunas that it has be it in terms of mind be it mentally or physically or whatever you call it spiritually whatever you call it whatever was prakriti when it was in this universe as an ordinary chit will get converted would be actually converted as in its impurities would be removed and it would get shuddha sattva that is what we mean is it clear sir yes thank you okay any other question okay if there is no other question we will uh, move on and cover the chit part of it so we said achit is made uh, it can be classified into three that is prakriti kala and shuddha sattva prakriti is what we see in this material universe uh, whatever i see plastic i see metal i see wood i see my own body human bodies living bodies that is made up of carbon there might be n number of elements and compounds all of them would fall under prakriti the body is non living correct when a person dies the body decays when a person is alive the body functions what is the difference we in sanatana dharma we like to identify the difference by using atma so we say atma is what makes it sentient when that atma goes away it becomes non sentient so the body is different from the atma and the body falls under prakriti then there is special shuddha sattva that you see in the physical body of bhagavan in the supreme abode of bhagavan and in the beings who populate the supreme abode of bhagavan now who are these beings that question will lead us to the classification of chit 
chit as i said refers to jiva and we call it jivatma itself adi atman shabda can very well be used for jiva as well as per vishishta advaita now this chit can be classified into three one is called baddha one is called mukta and one is called nitya baddha means that which is bound bound to what bound to prakriti bound to prakrita loka the physical universe it is bound to prakriti mukta is the state that a baddha attains when the baddha attains moksha so for moksha we say there are specific sadhanas when those are performed like for instance shankaracharya talks about sadhana chatushtayam in his brahma sutra bhashya bhagavad ramanuja talks about sadhana saptakam and so on so there are specific things that are has to be done in order to be able to attain moksha and there are many ways to attain moksha but when the atma attains moksha moksha is called as a state of mukti freedom freedom from what freedom from the bondage of karma freedom from the cycle of rebirth which happens in prakruta loka freedom from prakruta sharira all of that freedom is there in mukti the atma that attains mukti once it attains mukti it is called mukta it is called mukta mukta means that which has got mukti so baddha becomes mukta nothing else can become mukta you can get freedom only if you are not having freedom correct so baddha can only become mukta okay baddha is understood mukta is understood what about the third category nitya nitya which is sometimes called nitya mukta or sometimes called nitya suri all these terms refer to the same uh, same category of jivatma nitya means eternal this nitya is used as a short term for nitya mukta or nitya suri people if you look at people different people have different levels of karma not just people in plants animals wherever you see a sentient being there are different levels of karma correct are there beings that started with zero karma zero karma as in when i say i have karma if i have punya karma then in future something good will happen to me if i have papa karma then something bad will ha- happen to me these uh, karmas are coming to us through our thoughts words and actions if our thoughts words and actions are not purely satvik in nature that is when there is rajoguna or tamoguna associated with our thoughts words and actions then the result the phala that we get would also be accordingly affected correct whatever you saw that is what you would reap i am not just saying that an evil person would suffer and that a good person would uh, enjoy i am additionally saying that there are certain effects of rajoguna and tamoguna that prevent mukti itself so if you want to attain mukti 
you should come out of those qualities that are there in your mind. Your mind should be aimed at becoming Shuddha Sattva. It would not become, of course, our karma will prevent that, but you should try more and more. Eventually, when Mukti, that state is reached, it would become pure Sattva. That is how it works for us. But as per Vishishtadvaita Siddhanta, citing the Vedas, as well as the Puranas, and especially by citing Pancharatra Agama, or even Vaikhanasa as a matter of fact, a concept called Nitya Suri is explained where Nityas are Jeevatman only, but since the very beginning, they have been pure. Since the very beginning, they have been pure and they are going to remain pure for eternity. They are pure from the very beginning. The only difference then is that they are also pure. Ishvara is also pure. But Ishvara is the Swami. And these do not have Swamitva. They have Sevakatva. They are under the control of Paramatma. As I said, Ishvara. The word Ishvara comes from the word eat. Eat means controller. Ishvara also means controller. So, in Sanskrit, Ishvara means controller. Isha, Ishvara, these, all these words mean controller. So, Paramatma is called Ishvara as it controls Chit and Achit. It has control over the two. Chit is controlled by Ishvara. Nitya is controlled by Ishvara. But since the very beginning itself, it has been 100% pure. 100% knowledgeable. 100% able. That is how Nitya has been. Mukta has attained the exact same state of Nitya. But after some point of time, at time t equal to 0, Nitya was already pure. Mukta was not there. Mukta literally means one who has attained Mukti. That is possible only with before at some point of time Mukti was not attained. So although Mukta in terms of qualities is the exact same as Nitya, the difference is that at some point of time in the past, the Mukta was not a Mukta. But at all points of time in the past, the Nitya was a Nitya. The Nitya Suri was always a Nitya Suri. But the Mukta Atma was at some point of time a Baddha. That is the difference between the three types of Chit. That is Jivatma. Is this also clear? If there is any question, please feel free to ask. No, very, very clear. Uh, thank you so much, Swamiji. Uh, only clarification is uh, Jivatma, each Jivatma is unique. Each Jivatma has an identity. Very good question. So, as per Vishishtadvaita Vedanta, Every Jivatma is different from each other, but also similar to each other. In one way, they are similar to each other. In one way, they are different to each other. Where are they similar? Ishvara is Vibhu, omnipresent. Whereas the Jivatma is Anu. It is an infinitesimally tiny uh, region of space that is occupied by this Atma. When I say Atma is occupying space, then the question will arise. Is it What is it made up of? Is it really made up of any physical material? Because physical material can only be Prakriti and Shuddha Sattva. But Atma is not made up of Prakriti or Shuddha Sattva. Atma is made up of Jnana. Okay, that being said, this Atma 
Jeevatman are infinite in number. Paramatma is one in number. This Jeevas that are infinite in number, they have a lot of similarities. All of them are Anu. All of them uh, have to be able to possess a usable body in order to function as Chetanas, as living beings. All of them are going to come under the control of Ishvara. The eventual goal of all of them is to attain Mukti. If they haven't already attained, that is, if they are if they are Nityas, they don't have to attain Mukti. If they are uh, Muktas, it means they have already attained Mukti. But if they are Baddhas, then they have to attain Mukti. So in this manner, a lot of commonalities are there between the Jeevatman. They have differences between each other on the basis of karma, on the basis of how close they are to mukti, or even on the basis of whether they have become muktas or were eternally muktas, that is nitya muktas. So in this manner, there are similarities between the jivatma and also differences between the different jivatman. Does that answer your question, sir? Very well, very well. Thank you so much. Okay. Any other question? Okay. So, we saw that Achit is of three types. Prakriti, Kala, Shuddha, Sattva. Chit is of three types. Baddha, Mukta, Nitya. We said that Nitya is eternally pure. That means Nitya has always had Shuddha Sattva. Mukta has Shuddha Sattva. Baddha has Mishra Sattva that we have represented as Prakriti in the slide. This is the difference between the natures of these three. In the Vedas, there are several statements. Uh, for instance, uh, when the statement uh, Sada Pashyanti Surayaha, Tadvishnoho Paramampadam Sada Pashyanti Surayaha, when that statement comes, there the Surayaha is taken to mean Nitya Surayaha. That is the Nitya Suris. Sada Pashyanti, they always say. Where? In Vishnu's Paramapada, that is the supreme abode of Vishnu. In this manner, uh, Yatra Purve Sadhya Santi Devaha. There also sadhyas santi. That part, sadhya, it is taken to be an indication of nityas. So in this manner, in the Vedas, we have this. In Pancharatra Agama especially, multiple times the concept of nitya is discussed. And uh, uh, when Pancharatra is an Agama at the end of the day, it talks about uh, methods of worship. So there it has a separate section on the methods of worship of these beings. Anyway, that being said. So the concept of Nitya is there. The concept of Mukta is there. The concept of Baddha is there. The aim of the Baddha is to become a Mukta. The Mukta by itself will not have any aim. Correct? Its only aim will be to remain as a Mukta. The Nitya is also going to remain a Nitya. It is not going to transform into anything. Prakriti by itself cannot become Shuddha Sattva. Kala is a dimension. Prakriti is where Sattva Guna, Rajoguna and Tamoguna, all the three are mixed up. The mixed up state would remain a mixed up state. So when a Baddha becomes Mukta, how does its Mishra Sattva become Shuddha Sattva? The Baddha would lose the body and all the qualities, not only the physical body, but all the mental qualities and properties that are not sattvic. All of them would be removed and only sattva would remain. A new Shuddha Sattva Sharira would be taken up. This is what happens when the Atma crosses the Viraja Nadi and enters Vaikuntha. So, in this manner, Prakriti is associated with the Paddha and Shuddha Sattva is associated with the Mukta. Okay, but wait. We said that we need to look at Achit in order to understand the relationship between Ishvara and Chit. 
that is where we brought achit in one way we can understand what is that it is not chit that attains mukti by itself it is ishvara that grants mukti to the chit so the jivatma does not attain mukti by itself it is granted mukti by the paramatma when does it grant the mukti mukti is granted by paramatma when jivatma follows the specific procedures mentioned for the attainment of mukti in the scriptures these are collectively called as brahma vidyas so by following brahma vidya which deals with the uh, the ways to attain mukti the jivatma is granted mukti by paramatma this is how it is explained in vishishta advaita we do not say that it becomes a mukta by itself baddha becomes mukta by the grace of ishvara nitya is eternally pure but it is still an eternal sevaka of ishvara in the state of mukti in the state of moksha therefore there is still some difference between paramatma and jivatma there is some level of difference between the two as per vishishta advaita in which way we will see in greater detail in the next class uh, we have uh, swarupa nirupaka dharma satyatva anandatva satyatva jnanatva anantatva amalatva anandatva these qualities are there the defining qualities and then there are defined qualities that are properties which are called nirupita swarupa dharmas like jnana bala aishwarya virya shakti tejas that are displayed by the ishvara so when the jiva attains mukti we will see all of these in greater detail but even after becoming a mukta it remains different from ishvara likewise nitya is different from ishvara this much has to be kept in mind so chit will by itself never become ishvara jivatma will never become paramatma no matter how much it contemplates no matter how much it says i am uh, that uh, i am only brahman i am only brahman if it contemplates that way also it will not become the ishvara but it will become mukta that is what it can become why is that so because ishvara was eternally in the realized state you are entering the realized state only now so there is a difference between you and ishvara yes definitely but nitya was also eternally in the realized state ishvara was also eternally in the realized state you say that nitya also has infinite knowledge infinite ability and so on then what is the difference between nitya and ishvara is nitya the same as ishvara or can a nitya become ishvara the answer to both of these questions is no nitya is also different from ishvara nitya is always in the mode of servitude towards ishvara whatever the nitya does is defined by the ishvara whatever the ishvara does is defined by the ishvara itself that difference is there between ishvara and nitya so as i said in the previous class vishishta advaita is a midway between dvaita and advaita we say there is oneness and there is also difference where is oneness where is difference if we understand that we understand vishishta advaita and this was the intent of today's class to explain the classification of entities in vishishta advaita this had to be done 
so that we understand the concept of Nitya Suri, which we are going to see in the next class because we have to see about the lives of Alvars. The Alvars were Nitya Suris. They were eternally in the state of Moksha, but they still descended to earth to impart some knowledge. That is what the Siddhanta says. We will look at them in greater detail. So if I have to talk about Alvaris, and if I say that Alvar is an incarnation of this Nitya Suri, then the question will arise, what is Nitya Suri? Then if I say eternal Sevaka of Bhagavan, then people might think, oh, maybe in every life he is the Sevaka. That is not so. So Nitya is not bound by Prakriti. Nitya is not bound by the cycle of birth and death. Nitya takes birth whenever it wants, takes death whenever it wants. It is not bound. Mukta is also not bound. Mukta is free from the cycle of birth and death. Baddha is not. Baddha is bound by the cycle of birth and death. Punarapi Jananam, Punarapi Maranam, Punarapi Janani Jathare Shayanam, as Shankaracharya says. We take it as a repetition of births and deaths that happen without being in control of the Baddha. So is this clear? I think very clear, be... very clear. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. If there is any question, please let me know. Is there any questions? I think there is no question and even you can enter in the chat box. Okay. There is no questions, I guess, uh, Acharya Any notes you can share us, uh, share for us to read? Yes, definitely. Uh, I will uh, share a link to notes that you can uh, refer to uh, with regards to this specific uh, concept of uh, the classification of entities. I will share, I will uh, try to find an uh, English notes and share it with you. We will also upload that uh, link in the YouTube channel. You can read it in the description. Yes. And next time onwards, I will also try to bring direct links to uh, notes that are available so that it is easy for people to refer. Yes. These kinds of concepts, uh, like fundamentally, you, you would you would be able to learn about this concept if you go through uh, Yatindra Mata Deepika, or if you go through Sri Bhashyam. Sri Bhashyam is a very great work. That going there is a uh, going there is like jumping into the ocean to find uh, to learn about this uh, small <laughs> topic, uh, but. Uh, uh, yes, definitely in Yatindra Mata Deepika, uh, this concept is discussed. But Yatindra Mata Deepika is a work that is meant to summarize the school of Yatindra. Yatindra is Bhagavad Ramanuja. So uh, the school of Bhagavad Ramanuja is summarized by the work Yatindra Mata Deepika. I'm pretty sure uh, translations of it are available online from archive.org. We must be able to find it. So if I find a link to it, I will share. If there is other, so there are lots of other works that discuss this in detail. Uh, for example, uh, Manavala Mamunigal has discussed it. Uh, Vedanta Deshika has discussed it in uh, Rahasya Trayasara. Uh, so there are many works that talk about these topics. I will try to find a simple and concise one that is easy to understand and share it with you.
Anything else? Guruji, can we stop sharing the screen? Done. Yeah, thanks. So all the sessions are uploaded in the YouTube channel. You can view it as many times as possible and whenever the, it is possible for you all. So I would like to share the picture poster of tomorrow's session, which will start at six o'clock to seven o'clock. You can ask any queries regarding Ayurveda, yoga and spirituality with Dr. Sanjeev Nayak. Kindly do prepare with your questions and get benefit out of it. Thank you. Thank you, Guruji. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, sincere apologies for the delay. No problem. So if anybody is having any queries, please write to us at feedback.sa at gmail.com. And if you have any of your friends or family friends would like to register to this program, kindly drop your number in the chat box. I will be adding you to the WhatsApp group and you will get the updates. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome, ma'am. Shall we conclude the session then? Yes. Vidya Vapya Vibudhottamatam Dhanam Kurupes Dharad Gurum Karuna Karakya Achmina Thasamaram Bhamna Thayamana Madhya Mamas Madhacharya Pariyantam Mande Guru Paramparam Thank you for attending. Thank you Guruji.